Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm your host, Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Tulio Vela. What's going on, my friend? It, it, it's I been feel a month. good. It's been a month, four a weeks month off. off. We're back live. I feel of, good. A lot has happened in the month. It has. A ton has <laughs> happened in a month. We, there's no way we can catch it all up tonight, no. but uh, we're going to try to with uh, two, uh, you know, very people with... Uh, Soft spoken. Soft spoken and not a lot of opinions. No. Two past presidents of the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association join us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Fickman. Rob, how are you? Good evening. Good evening. I'm glad you could be here. Thanks for uh, inviting me back on the show. I don't uh, usually get invited back to places. Uh, you've been you've been invited a couple times here. Well, you all make mistakes. What can I say? <laughs> you know, what's the definition of insanity? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> and also joining us, Todd DuPont, former uh, host of this show as well. A few years. Right, glad thank, to have you back. Thank you for having me. Um, when was the last time you were on here? You came uh, on last probably year. about a year ago. Yeah, that's what I thought. I think I had long hair back then. Is that yeah, when I you think you had long hair on the face. Southern general. I <laughs> had a number of looks on the program. You know, it's important in our business to change your look on a regular basis. I think he was he was in the midst of a Civil War reenactment, I think. Never know. I was in the midst of a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only man that I know that while... With the with the ZZ top beard, and uh, hair as it was, uh, to get a not guilty on a one sentence close, it happens. It happens. Mr. Dupont, ladies and gentlemen. On a what? On a uh, on a on a cocaine case. Oh, well. I lost my first trial after I cut all facial hair and hair, and I was a little bit aggravated at that. Yeah. The superstition got to you. We have those. We, uh, we got a great show tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a lot of good topics to talk about, including we're going to get to uh, talk a lot about special prosecutors and special yeah. counsel this evening. Uh, I know Mr. Fickman does, has no opinion on that subject, ladies and gentlemen, zero opinion on Trump uh, whatsoever and what's happening. But, but we'll get to that a little later. We're going to have Twitter up all night at HCCLA underscore TV. So you can send us your questions and comments there. We'll also open up the phone lines around 8.30, 8071794 is the number, so you can jump in with your questions and comments. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot for you to get in on if you want to this evening. But let's start, guys, with uh, the big news locally. I want to start locally first, and then we'll, we'll build our way up to uh, the national scene, if you will. Um, but the big news over the last couple weeks has been, of course, the Harris County bail bond lawsuit in federal court. Uh, we've been talking about a lot on this show. We kind of predicted uh, that Judge Rosenthal was going to rule the way she did, and she declared the Harris County bail schedule for the misdemeanor courts unconstitutional in a 193-page opinion, which was scathing, uh, just scathing. Um, the county hired, it, it's kind of weird because you have both the county attorney's office and outside counsel representing the judges. You've got one county court judge who says, settle this damn thing. We don't need to be a part of it, Judge Jordan. The others are still fighting. Kudos for him to standing up to it, do Exactly. That. And, then, and then you've got the county commissioners who don't want to settle it, I guess, other than Rodney Ellis, who's now right. back in the county commissioner's spot. And uh, so there's a lot of dissension. The DA's office, the, the sheriff's office, they're all in support of this. And what happens? The county decides they're going to appeal the ruling. Right. So what was supposed to go into effect this past Monday, May 15th, has now been stayed by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, pending the appeal of this injunction. Right. What, um, is, what does that mean, though? So it means the judge they can continue to do what they've been doing for the last 30 years. Right. And Rob, I mean, you've been the most <laughs> outspoken uh, about this issue for a number of years. Um, seems like every time you come on our program, you you aren't lacking of anything to say about it. So I, I wanted to start with you and get your thoughts on the lawsuit, Judge Rosenthal's ruling, and the appeal. Okay, but there won't be in time for anybody. Okay, no, I'll, I'll cut you off. I'll cut you off. <laughs> I know. Don't you worry. Um, the uh, the the system that we've had in place for 30 years, as these guys know. Um, and Todd's been involved in this issue as well and trying to get the judges to do right, is the judges have systematically denied PR bonds. And we're talking about the county criminal court judges that handle misdemeanors, as you know. And they have systematically denied PR bonds to uh, poor people who could not afford to make a bond. And so as a consequence of that, the poor people have been left in jail 
Um, and then they would be brought to court and they would be given a, an option, really no option, but this is what they would be told. If you plead guilty, you can get at today or maybe tomorrow. If you plead not guilty, you want to fight for your innocence, well, we'll come back in a month or two. Now, these are poor people that need to get out and feed their families, so typically they pled guilty. Typically their lawyers spent no time with them, and so we refer to this system as the plea mill. Uh, it is uh, an abomination. The uh, 15 out of the 16 county court judges that uh, sit right now have perpetuated this system. Um, they have, um, there's been a tacit conspiracy in my opinion. Um, and what happened was a couple of, uh, a civil rights group really came to town that sued around the, the uh, country and they engaged and got with uh, one of the big law firms that had some power and they filed a giant lawsuit against the county and it went to federal court in front of one of our very best federal judges who's very honorable, Judge uh, Rosenthal. She heard lots of testimony. She heard from Judge Jordan. She heard from uh, a lot of people about how the system worked and she was aghast. Um, the county court judges uh, are used to doing this to people and so they justify it to themselves. The federal district court judge who is not used to this sort of abuse um, was aghast and as, as y'all said that uh, she issued a scathing opinion saying they needed to stop it and they needed to immediately start granting PR bonds to these poor people on uh, misdemeanors. And what did they do? They filed an appeal, that is the county, county commissioners filed an appeal and what that did is that stopped the judge's order and in layman's terms that meant that the county courts get to keep abusing poor people by systematically denying them PR bonds, and systematically uh, putting them in, them in that position where their choice was plead guilty and get out today, plead not guilty and get out later. Basically what it boils down to is in Harris County if you're poor in order to get your liberty you have to plead guilty. And the system that's based on that, sorry I'm getting pedantic, but any kind of system that's based on that where a poor person has to plead guilty to get their liberty back is a system that is immoral. Todd, is, how, now, not that I have an opinion on it. Right. I mean, Todd, how can at this point with 193 pages of a ruling from a very well-respected judge, how can the county justify appealing this issue? <sighs> Of course, the wheels of justice seem to turn extremely slow. Uh, each one of these judges could today or yesterday or in a few weeks ago decided to, regardless of the lawsuit, do their own thing, just like Court 16 did. They're not, they're not, they're, you know, not interdependent upon each other. Uh, perhaps they would like the Supreme Court or somewhere else to give them direction, but right is right. Um, what is the and all the stakeholders really other than 15 county court judges right. really seem to agree with the federal judge yeah the DA right um, the sheriff who wants to clear out his jail not house his use his jail to house people that are charged with misdemeanors not convicted even it seems like the major stakeholders are in agreement with the tone and direction of where the federal lawsuit seems that it will end up. What's disturbing is how much money yeah. the county is using to defend this lawsuit and pay other lawyers when perhaps that money could be directed towards other situations in our county. And, and that, that when, when, it, when the smoke settles down, that is going to be uh, one of the more egregious things of the lawsuit the amount of money spent to defend a system that's broken and constitutionally wrong. I agree. What is the next step? So the judge ordered uh, not only uh, more people who are recently being arrested for misdemeanors to be g granted PR bonds, but to let out all the individuals who are in the jail for lower level misdemeanor crimes to be released. So what is the next step that the Fifth Circuit has said no to stay uh, the judge's order? And so what's the next step? Do they go to a trial on the merits of this? Well, actually, the, uh, the, the plaintiffs who filed the lawsuit against the uh, judges have filed uh, this week, they have filed a, uh, a petition with the uh, Fifth Circuit 
to reverse their decision and uh, go ahead and impose Judge Rosenthal's order. But in the meantime, as Todd was just describing, the system will continue unless there's something different. Uh, it, will, it will just continue. Todd, you referenced how much money is spent. The, the viewers might be interested to know that the county has spent $3 million defending this immoral system. That it, number was two weeks ago. Yeah, it's more than that. We have to think that we're encroaching now I mean, these are $500 an hour law firms and things like this. Uh, What's the, the money is going to get out of hand. Now, I will say this. Today, I went to 701 San Jacinto, a Harris County jail, uh, one of three, or well, there's three or four. Usually, they have five-inch binders for the inmates, mm -hmm. and I've never understood if they update them daily. It seems like they need to because if somebody comes in, they need to find their defendant by spin and so forth. The binders were both A through whatever, F, you know, they were three inch binders. It wasn't a big binder, which to me means there's less people in the jail. Maybe. Well, they weren't five inch binders. I made note of that. Uh, I thought that was interesting because we've all walked in jails and seen it, there are two binders and they're five inch, you know, ring binders. I, what, what I, I don't know if that's cause and effect of a lawsuit, if there is progressive change going on, but we collectively don't see each part. Right. Uh, well, and how much is it is the non-prosecution of class B and class A marijuana offenses too? That's probably part of it. You know, I mean, that, that also could factor into yeah, this. Yeah, I'm telling y'all, they, uh, they were small binders. I think this is an attempt for the misdemeanor judges to uh, try to show that, oh wait, we the, the reforms that we're implementing are working. However, I have recently had uh, an individual not on a, it was actually a driving while license invalid, which is the same type of plaintiff that, uh, sp that was used to, sp to, to spin this lawsuit, to, to commence a lawsuit where, um, the issue was that they couldn't verify his two numbers, his two phone numbers. That was the problem. This particular judge did not release him on a PR bond. Uh, they just reduced the bond, which is not what the goal was to do. The, their goal was to release this guy. It was driving while license invalid. Release him. Let him clear his license. Let's let's do it the proper way. And, and they take their phone, and nobody remembers phone numbers. Everybody's cell phone. Of course, number. right. <clears throat> and when they take the phone in the property, nobody, when they're interviewed by pretrial, can give two phone numbers. They now, can't access their phone. Right. Well, I well. believe there is a trend that they're allowing numbers because I've seen my own clients have small pieces of paper. It's crude with three numbers on them. The question is, is that a commonplace practice? Is it who's working the desk that night? Uh, it is not a form. I've often just seen it on scratch pieces of paper. But pretrial won't, and when I was president, this issue was ripe. And the court said, uh, we can't let them out on a PR bond if we can't verify a residence and uh, a contact. That was the two th questions. Our response is HCCLA's, HCCLA's response was, well, we can't give you two phone numbers if we don't have access to our phone. There's Nobody I, remembers phone numbers. Look, one of the issues in, in um, now I agree with what you're saying, but one of the issues that we have here is, is good faith and bad faith. And, um, you know, we have, you know, we're talking about our county criminal court judges. We know them, and as far as, you know, having a trial in front of them, they'll give you a fair trial, most of them. But this is, we're talking about a policy here that uh, when implemented and perpetuated by an entire group, it does a lot of damage. And it's gone on for three decades now. And the, the bad faith here is that these are intelligent people. They know what the plea mill is. They know that they that people are ending up getting cornered and forced to plead guilty, um, and yet they're continuing to perpetuate the system and fighting to keep it alive. This is what's really disgraceful: is that the judges are intelligent people, and 
what has their defense been? Their defense for perpetuating the system and not granting PR bonds was, well, you know, we had a system that was broken and we couldn't analyze people because the tool for analyzing whether or not people were a danger was broken. The tool, that is the, the, the evaluation. Pre okay. Service. Yeah, that the, the, right. the their so tool, created. and that's what they said was their reason that our, our pretrial services tool for evaluating people uh, whether or not they would return to court was broken, and my, and and they said that uh, that was their reason. Now, in all the years I've talked to the different judges, I've heard lots of different reasons. That was never the universal reason. That was just one of many reasons. But they all agreed not on the reason why they were doing it, but they all agreed to do it and perpetuate it. What I would say to that is, if the tool for calculating the judge's salary was broken, they would have fixed uh, that 20 years ago. And I'm having to work real hard not to use obscenities right now because the truth of the matter is that is uh, just a fabrication. Um, whether or not they believed it or not, they could have fixed it a long time ago. It's an excuse for perpetuating, continuing to perpetuate a, a vile system. And um, uh, shame on them. Shame on them. They're, and these are intelligent people. These are not bad people. These are people that are perpetuating a bad system. I will say, and, and what I think is happening is that the, the county is trying to put together a good packet, so to say, to show, like, look at all these reforms we're doing. Right. We're doing well. Right. But you know what? For too long, they've done the wrong thing. So they lack credibility. And then they got money. They got the MacArthur grant. They got awarded money. This county was awarded money to fix problems that it created. Talk about irony. So you go out and you screw up your own system and you abuse poor people and then you win a grant to change that. Well, and how do you sit there and say we're changing the system when you have a number of judges who are also being an impediment to granting of pretrial diversion? Right. It's I mean, not. You, you, you can't say on one hand we are reforming the system when you are standing in the way of a district attorney who is trying to herself reform the system by granting people pretrial diversions that on, changes just on a lot more things. The idea a little bit, but it's still a judge thumbing their nose to the ideas of what justice becomes in a criminal case. Look, and, and uh, this is... Uh, but it all starts with bail. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and if somebody is cornered into pleading guilty we don't know whether or not they were innocent or guilty. We never know. And so there's presumably many people over the years, poor people that have been coerced essentially into pleading guilty who are stuck with a criminal record. And some of the judges said to me, well, we can't grant them a PR bond because Rob, they have a criminal record. I said, well, judge, if you look at that criminal record, you'll see that they pled on their first day in court because of your friggin' system. And in 2013, I wrote a letter to all the judges. It made me real popular with the judges, I can assure you. And I asked them uh, as nicely as I could to increase the granting of PR bonds. And what happened after that, um, there were a few that wouldn't speak to me anymore. Uh, and the glaring was, was uh, uh, nice. But what happened after that, Todd was president. And Todd went and met with, why don't you, Todd, you went and met with one of the judges uh, and tried to push this. And they were... He, Todd did his very best to push this on behalf of HCCLA, and with the best effort, they 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 were, they were like what they were like a a, a a brick wall. It would move, right? Judge Ross told me to my face. We he and I sat. Uh, he I expressed my concerns with regards to having access to phone numbers, and uh, I believe in his. Uh, and Judge Ross has always been honest. I think he's a very good judge. He was granting PR bonds back then. I don't think necessarily, you know, you have now 16 different castles, right? Uh, Judge Ross understood the angst that we had with regards to this issue. It wasn't on the forefront. I mean, it, we'd been pushing it. We certainly had been pushing this issue. Uh, but what Judge Ross has indicated to me was that He's going to look into that and fix it, and I trusted his word. And, and here we are, four well, years well, later, and there's a lawsuit. I'm not espousing any of this on Judge Ross. This was my communications with the court. Uh, he was the presiding judge. Right. I, I will say, no less than uh, speaking of Judge Ross, I, in no less than four cases, I approached him this week, and PRs on all of them, he, which I don't necessarily know if he's a visiting judge and just being like, you know. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, right? right? But the, uh, I, the idea is if it's, 
if that is the right thing to do, and I do believe even back then in 14, uh, that Judge Ross believed that's the right thing to do, uh, just because he believes that's the right thing to do doesn't mean everybody else is going to do the right thing. Well, also, let's look at the statistics. In the county courts, there's about 50,000 misdemeanors a year filed in Harris County. They were granting less than 10% on, on those cases. They were granting uh, on less than 10% of those cases were they granting PR bonds. And that's been the historical trend for years here. And so there was no wild granting of PR bonds. They were systematically denying them. And the, it's a whole different deal, Jimmy, but you know, the magistrates are the ones that set the initial bond. Right. The magistrates work for the county courts and the magistrates were afraid to grant PR bonds because if they granted too many PR bonds, like there was one magistrate that did, he They'd got fired. Goodbye. Yeah. So they needed the, the, the you know what? The only and way there was a scandal with the magistrates. Yeah, so yeah. that's true. They were yeah. abusing people. Really the only way this is ever going to end, like some bad things in our in our country, have only ended when uh, the federal government has gotten involved, and that's what's happened here. We have a very highly respected jurist. And I'll call her that. Uh, Judge Lee Rosenthal is as respected as they come. She wrote a brilliant opinion, and uh, justice will come when that opinion is followed, and not until then. So, what's your prediction? What do you think happens ultimately at I think the federal gonna, level? I think it's going to take another uh, year, and ultimately it, it will settle some fashion where most of what <clears throat> Judge Rosenthal has ordered happens. But I think they're gonna, the county will do everything it can to drag its feet for bad motive. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. What's your opinion, Todd? I would hope that the undercurrent shows these county court judges because, quite frankly, at least three or four of them aren't running again. They're not going to be here in 18. Uh, of course, I believe there's going to be a lot of people lining up to run, and I would imagine that'll be an issue that they're going to run a platform more on. Uh, with regards to the end of the federal lawsuit, I believe uh, Rosenthal... Uh, opinion will hold and we're going to see we're going to see that they've spent millions of dollars good money after bad that's my opinion at the end of the day and I agree with and Harris County is going to be uh, disgraceful defend you look it's they don't have to defend this bad position Right. This lawsuit could be over in a phone call, maybe two or three. Well, and as you said, there are county officials who are siding with the lawsuit. I mean, our DA is Almost siding with all it. Almost all of the them. The sheriff is siding with it. These are not left-wing ACLU people. These are law enforcement. This is, these are the yeah. top law enforcement agents in this when you county. you have the sheriff and the district attorney of a county this size, which is very right. unique in the United States, saying they agree with the federal judge? Yeah. Isn't that enough? Yeah, it's basically I, uh, really. Stop isn't that picking on the, enough? It's it's this. Yeah. Stop picking on the little people that are charged with small offenses. Give them a chance. Give them PR bonds so their lawyer can actually try to investigate their case. If they're not guilty, maybe they'll be found not guilty. Maybe the case will get dismissed. It's not going to get dismissed if they're forced to plead guilty the first day they go in. And by God, they wouldn't do it to their own family. So sh you know what? Shame on them for all the years they've done it. Shame on them. Shame on you for all the years you've done it. Uh, all of you. The other, I would name you right now, but I don't have time. <laughs> the other big story locally that's been uh, yeah yeah up, you don't want me to. How do you well, follow we gotta, that? Because <laughs> we got we got a transistor. Yeah, I know right? transition. I, mean, um, I just made myself that much more popular. I didn't like. have a natural segue. From, yeah, you know, <laughs> Rob's I, angry I, rant. I'd name yeah, you, you do. If I could. Okay. Um, so well well, our, well played. I know. I try. Our, our DA Kimog, uh, of course, has been dealing with this highly publicized case of David Temple for a while now uh, since she took office and she came in and said she was going to review the case and decide what her next step was going to be. Well we found out last week that that step was she was going to recuse herself. Uh, a lot of people were predicting, a lot of the naysayers were predicting that she wouldn't do it. Um, a lot of people were calling on her to do it, that it was the right thing to do given the, the connections that her office had, multiple connections that her office had to the case. And lo and behold, she did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and today we got uh, special prosecutors in the form of the Texas Attorney General's Office uh, appointed by the new judge in the 178th, Kelly Johnson, to now take over this case. Where are they um, from, do you know? They are, well, you have uh, Lisa Tanner, who I believe has been with the AG's office for a while uh, and tried several high profile cases. And then you have the former Brazos County DA, uh, Bill Turner. So they're the two that have taken over the case. I think Kim Og, to make that 
<clears throat> decision is the right decision. I think yeah. anybody <clears throat> that's followed this, even as a passing, would agree it's the right thing to do. Uh, the only question is why did it take so long? Uh, but perhaps she wanted just to instill in her own I her mind and ideas that it was the right thing to do. Well, but you say that it took her so long. But what what I'm I'm impressed by, and certainly you can criticize our DA for a lot of things. But what I've been impressed by so far is that she does really think out her decisions. She's not one to make a snap decision about things. I mean, she she went in with a transition team. She started looking. Well, at some stuff. would argue against that. What? Well, firing people by email. Agre that, and that's what I'm saying. Okay. There's a lot to criticize her for. <laughs> I mean, okay? that, that, that <laughs> might be a snap I, decision. I, I agree. There with was that. nobody brought in to have but, a meeting about thank you for your service. I agree with that. But but what I mean in terms of some of the policy decisions, the the non-prosecution of Class A and Class B misdemeanors, the expansion of pretrial diversion programs, these decisions about you know, how we're going to recuse ourselves from, from office. I mean, I think with regard to the, the really big picture legal issues uh, that are out there in the forefront, I think she's doing the, the, she's making the right call. She hasn't had a misstep, guys, to this well, point. Well, one, one thing I would compliment her on is that she's taken uh, people that were uh, former prosecutors um, who were on the defense side but started out as prosecutors and brought them back into the DA's office and these are lawyers with 30 years worth of experience and I think it adds to the integrity of the office. It gets, uh, they're not that young but they're fresh blood mm -hmm. in that office and these are people that are very committed to uh, justice and she's also brought over some people from the U.S. Attorney's Office so um, it's, it's kind of getting a... Uh, uh, a fresh start, if you will, from the DA's office, getting us away from the Chuck Rosenthal gang, um, the, the total disgrace, um, and getting us to, uh, um, you know, people that are in positions of, of, of authority there that are well respected on both sides of the bar. Something that's new that I'm not sure uh, most know about or the viewers, generally uh, before a DA AUG, you got caught with prostitution. Uh, there was no the I whole. I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was no AIDS, Shh. you know, AIDS class and dismissed community service dismissed. It was usually they went after the Johns pretty hard, and so uh, I had a. Uh, There's just a lot of it, double entendre. Well, I had a, I had a recent <laughs> client where the guy, it was a perfect sting. Right. It's on back page. It's on yeah. video. It's wow. on audio. He comes in. He puts just keep the going, money JV. In. I'm enjoying this. He puts the money in, and you know, and, and it's an obvious setup, and he knows it. Everybody's getting nervous, and the cops bust in, and the whole. And the guys should be a good pre-trial intervention kind of guy that would have been denied flat because they got him cold. Uh, previously, right. so we go in and we're about to set this thing for trial because this guy can't. That's a bad label right across your forehead. Yeah, and and I'm about to set it for trial, and the prosecutor says, "Oh no, we have a new directive for Johns in this particular scenario." I got one today myself. It's what an AIDS, is it? AIDS class, community service, uh, Nolly. Take the T-Raz. Take the T-Raz. After that, it's, it's a, a risk assessment test one has to take. Oh, to make sure that they're not bad guys. Well, it's just they, I guess, then the high risk class, or low risk. Right. Kind of like don't go out and hire a prostitute. Right. You know, you learn about the dangers and such. Decision making. It, to me, it seems like Help they just look at somebody's criminal history. Yeah. Look, Dr. May could, and you might consider having her on. She'd be a really good guest for you. We consider anybody on this show, Todd. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> She's very loose standards not on who for gets the, on Not this for show. the new season show, though. Not for the new season. <laughs> I don't think there's any standard for this show. I mean, they, right, they well, you know, well, at least for me. It's the new thing. And so this guy who generally would have uh, had to go to trial, take a deferred, or get some sort of conviction, now has a new shot. So, and hey, you know, if you were thinking about it, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, so is it the idea that perhaps any of the naysayers of DA Og uh, just needed her to settle in and let some of her ideas come out and flesh out? Is this uh, what we're so. seeing with her? I think they'll always be naysayers. I mean, the, the, yeah, the yeah, bottom line is we're going through a, we're going through a, 
political and cultural, you know, change in this county. And yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people who are upheaval. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people who are unwilling to accept it. And, yeah. and and she is the change right now. She's kind of the front and center of the change because what she's doing is is so uh, such a radical departure from what's been done in the previous administrations right. that I think you, you, she's never going to please everybody. Uh, but I but I do think you're seeing a shift uh, in a lot of things, and and that's going to bring me to the next topic. But uh, I want to let everybody know we're going to open up the phone lines now. Already? It is 8:30. Yeah, it's 8:30. That's we're not quick. Halfway through. 713-807-1794 is the number. We also, I still have Twitter up. You can, you can communicate with us here, ladies and gentlemen, at HCCLA underscore TV. Um, oh, I probably just should answer. This will save a question. Aquarius. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Swipe right. Um, oh, and also, shout out to a friend named Mike who's uh, had a rough road. He's on a good road now. Hey, Mike. There you Thank go. you. Sorry about that. No, but, but. The opposite is happening at our national level, oh, um, and we're 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 gonna we're gonna build this into a crescendo. But <laughs> last week, I'm just happy we haven't been incinerated. Uh, <laughs> well, that might be coming next. Um, but last week, our attorney general issues a directive about for U.S. attorneys' offices now to go and seek the highest charges possible to reinstitute the charging of any case that has a mandatory minimum sentence and you are to seek the highest sentence possible yeah. under the laws. I mean, just a complete, not only 180 reversal from what uh, Kim Og is doing here locally, but a complete reversal from the, the changes that had been done. The DOJ. The last uh, 30 years. Yeah. Well, well and, for uh, at least, least for the last eight years. Yeah, under Obama There's and Holder. There's certainly a trend to move that way. And I, it was called enlightenment. And he's going backwards, uh, he probably because he thinks it's 1858 and the Civil War is about to happen or is going on. And dinosaurs live with people. And you know, a Beauregard or whatever his name is. I mean, um, this is a bad thing. It's a horrible thing. You know, thing. And, and the U.S. attorneys who are experienced uh, uh, federal prosecutors know that they need to have leeway and have discretion, just as the district court judges do in federal court, and that when you order max everybody out, is that really going to achieve justice? No, it doesn't achieve anything like He's justice. He's going to appoint people that will follow his missive, much like a Sean Spicer or whoever else he puts up right. in front of people, and he's going to send that down to his line uh, right. assistant U United States attorneys who have to abide by right. that he's missive. No thinking allowed, no discretion allowed, now, just you follow know, the rules. About, Go stand on the rubber to line. Me, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I've been on the panel since 7 where I was focusing the last decade on criminal case, or federal criminal cases to half my practice. But it seems to me they would always charge the highest charge, just not necessarily seek the highest uh, punishment available. That's Meaning, true. Meaning some jurisdictions might tweak that a little bit. If you seek bond, then we're not going to offer a 5K1. Uh, we uh, in Florida, I had one where if they indict you, they don't dismiss charges. You either plead to all or go to trial on all. Like we've had pockets, right, of federal jurisdictions where they, but it, they all to me they they always brought the highest charge that they believe they could prove beyond reasonable doubt. That was a missive from the DOJ, right? Right. That's always been. I don't. And they that filed the U.S. Can't. Attorney's Manual. Yeah, okay. And I don't think but, Sessions changed that. No, but it's the outcome that counts. Well, well but no, but what, what he did change was there was a rollback on that, okay? Right. So the, the U.S. Attorney's Manual does say that, that prosecutors are obligated to charge the highest possible charge. But I believe it was in 2009 or 2010 was the beginning of the, the Holder Memorandums on charging. And I think the most recent one was about it, maybe a, a year or so before he, he, he left office, where there was a there was a formal rollback of you know charging decisions and and using discretion in what to charge. And this and this basically reverts back to what the the default is in the U.S. Attorney's Manual is to go after the highest charge, to go after the highest sentence possible. And to your point, Rob, what what is scary here is not only are you taking away the the discretion of the one of the 94 U.S. attorneys appointed U.S. attorneys in this uh, country, but also the AUSAs under yeah, them. Yeah, every federal prosecutor in but, the country. But by going back to we're going to charge mandatory minimums whenever we can, you have handcuffed the judges. 
right. you have handcuffed the judges. And, and we see federal judge after federal judge. Then they're going to utilize 3553. But they can't get below the mandatory minimum yeah, on 3553 no, unless there's a safety valve and unless right. the prosecutor moves for the safety valve. Yeah. And, and so what, what you see is there's been... In, this in, is all bad. It's just it's, bad. Well, in the bad last couple of years, bad. you've seen a couple federal judges who have left the bench who have been very vocal about this, yeah. who have said, this is, this is a broken system that we have because I have to now sentence somebody who I don't believe... In the should, sentence. Yes. I, that, I had a federal judge sentence somebody, and this was a number of years back under the guidelines, and he called me up. He said, uh, Fickman, will you take an appointment on appeal? I said, sure, judge. He said, I, I, I didn't want to sentence that person to what, but the, under the guidelines, the mandatory to. minimums, I had to see if you can reverse me. The judge asked me to reverse him because he had a, a what's called a soul, and yeah. he, wanted, <laughs> he couldn't live with himself well, with it. And unfortunately, it had been a plea. There was nothing I could do to undo it. And well, he went to the Fifth Circus. The Fifth, <laughs> the fifth Circuit. And we can, can kind of use this as a, a, as a way to get into the larger issue which happened yesterday. But, you, but, you know, in looking at everything that's happening uh, in, in the circus that is D.C. right now, when you see what happened with, with Sally Yates, when you see what happened with James Comey. One of the things that strikes me, okay, about this whole thing. Yeah, if you can narrow it all down to one thing, that's amazing. Well, here's what. Here, <laughs> I can't narrow it down to one thing, but this is, this is something that really strikes me about this. Is that now, because of, of Sally Yates getting fired, all right. because of Jim Comey getting fired, these two are now heroes, right? I think, yeah. Okay. But these are two people. You want to talk about perpetuating plea mills. Mm -hmm. Those are two people who have been career prosecutors, who have perpetuated this system of mandatory minimums, who have overcharged people, who have wrongfully charged people. I mean, Comey was one of the, the at the forefront of charging white collar people with crimes that they could not ultimately stand up in, in, at the Second Circuit. Well, it's the context. I mean, I, the, I, I agree, the whole but, ball but, game has changed. But it bothers me because... It bothers you that they're now heroes. That they're now heroes. These, these, these are people who have perpetuated a system of putting people away, who put who charge crimes at the federal level under the Hobbs Act for robbery cases that should be prosecuted in state court, and they put them away for 120 what, 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 years. What does it show you? It shows you that it has to be something really, 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 really yeah. bad to make those that were doing bad look good because they were up against this thing that's really bad. Or that how uninformed the American public truly is about the criminal justice system. There's no question. There's no... There's no okay. And, that, on and, that. And, and that's what really is is sad that you can that the American people can prop they can see these people as heroes because they don't know what's been happening. I'm not with sure these anybody that's people. voted for Donald Trump sees Comey as a hero. Probably not. I mean, straight up. But we're still talking about uh, um, a minority in this country because. We're going to talk about the election, not we mm -hmm. shouldn't, but I mean, okay. I mean, maybe 50% of those that can vote, vote, and maybe half of that 50% or thereabouts voted for Trump. So maybe a fourth of the country actually supported him, but less than a fourth, really. And so he three, was elected, Rob. Hey, no, he was, no regrets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he said that he that they He's elected, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, to make America, I don't know what again. Uh, no regret. But but you know where we're at now. Yeah. Okay. So now we have a special prosecutor, special counsel, who's really going to function as a special prosecutor to investigate all this. And I think it's the best thing that's happened to our country since the day before the election. And because uh, Mueller is highly respected. Yes. He worked under uh, the Bush administration and the Obama administration. He's as straight a shooter as you'll find. Uh, he's not going to be intimidated or bullied. Um, and what will be interesting to see, and I think all Americans should hope for the truth, whatever it is. Um, I know I do. Um, I certainly have my opinion about this uh, cat named Trump, but uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. In no, a it's irrelevant. I just, well, I but I, I hope that that uh, this is an opinion show. I, I hope that the that the investigation does get to the truth because the American people need to know the truth, whatever it is. And there's there's a. What we have to watch for now is whether or not we have a repeat of what happened under Richard Nixon because we're in the position where we have a president that does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, it appears, who has no constraints, and that's kind of like Nixon was back then. And Nixon fired, uh, told the attorney general on the Saturday, 
when Saturday Night Massacre, he told the then uh, Attorney General uh, Elliot Richardson to fire the special prosecutor. And Elliot Richardson refused and, and resigned. So on down the line. And then the he went to Ruckelhaus General. and told Ruckelhaus to fire him, and he resigned. And finally, they ended up with that guy Bork, who agree, who was sworn in as Attorney General, and he fired the special prosecutor Cox. And there was such an uproar in our country that that's how our local hero Leon Jaworski became the special prosecutor on the the. the the uh, Watergate case. And so I think we're very much in the same territory and it'll be interesting to see in the next month or two whether or not Trump tries to fire this special prosecutor because there there should be an absolute uproar if it does. And I want to come back to this, but we've got a phone call I want to take right now as well. Hello, thank you for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I had a couple questions about um, what you were talking about in the beginning of your show in Harris County and specifically about pretrial services. Um, just wondering, who are they supposed to serve? Is it a service department geared toward helping clients or defendants? Or do they work for the judges? Do they work for the DA's office? Uh, they seem to have ex parte communications with the judges frequently, and also, in my experience, have um, gone to talk to clients in jail without attorney being present. I'm just wondering, what is the point of that department? I mean, why do they need to verify information when a PR bond uh, should be granted or in some cases already has been. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the, thanks for the call. Um, they have an extraordinary amount of power. Recently, I have seen them. And so what's happening now is the judges are just looking to them. They work for, for the, the answer. judges at the end of the day. Yes. And it's, in, it's amazing that the judge, you know, will spit out, uh, he deserves a, a PR bond because of X, Y, and Z. And purely valid, 100% reasons. And the judge will then look to the PR representative and they will say yay or nay, which is huge. And it has nothing to do with what about my arguments of X, Y, and Z that are completely compatible and, and valid under the law. However, a pretrial comes and says yay or nay. And I've actually had some of them, and I respect a lot of them. They're all, they're good people, and they're trying to do the best they can, but they're being stretched really thin. Well, and, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, well, well, for yeah. many years, for, for, for uh, all these years where we haven't been getting PR bonds for poor people or for any people, um, very few, um, the, P, the pretrial services was co-opted. And the judges used it them to, to uh, I am. What happened is the uh, judges used pretrial services uh, to uh, oversee people who were on bonds, surety bonds, like they hired a bondsman to get out of jail and the judge would give them a bunch of conditions, like it sounded like they were already on probation. You have to do all these things while you're on bond. And they made pretrial services uh, uh, supervise that person that was on a surety bond and so their job that was they were supposed to do, which was overseeing pretrial uh, PR bonds, got shoved aside because of the minimal number of PR bonds, and they then became an aid, basically, to the bondsmen, who we haven't mentioned here, but they have a big hand in all that's gone on here behind the scenes. Um, but the bottom line is now pretrial services is trying to find its footing. They have a new uh, head guy. I've spoken at length with the uh, previous... Um, uh, the leader or our chief of that uh, 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 outfit, uh, Carol Oler, who's very well intentioned and fought for years to try to get the judges to grant PR Absolutely. bonds. And she ran up against the wall. It didn't matter what she said. And we've talked about it, that that risk assessment was just as good as it needed to be. Um, that's just, anyway, in answer to the lady's question, um, yeah, they, they work for the judges, but they're also supposed to be an honesty to it, you know, where they're presenting to the judges an honest assessment, um, and it, the, the assessment became meaningless. I mean, if they're going to do an assessment and the, they know ahead of time that the judge is going to deny the person, then what's the point of even doing it? There was a very gray line that I'm not sure that I'd like to discuss or get your opinions on where the PR uh, pretrial services came and said, you know, Judge, uh, he should get a PR bond, but at the same time, I, he needs some serious help. I think he needs help, and I'm kind of, I'm really, I'm, I am cautious about uh, saying he should, he, he should get a PR bond, even though 
he very well should get a PR bond. Let's push pause right there and just go to another county. You make bond, you go to court. Right. There's no urine testing. Nobody like sees you. Yeah. You're presumed innocent. Imagine that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Their courts might be once a month or two. You just show up to court. And what happens here, Todd? Not that. No. <laughs> you go into court here. I walked into court here in the county court, and I saw a judge, this was a couple years back, um, and you're going to do this, and you're going to wear this electronic. This is on misdemeanor. Yeah. You're going to wear this monitor on you that will detect if you have any alcohol in your system, and you're going to put a guardian interlock on your, your car. When they're charged with theft. When you're not, yeah, you're not an alcohol-related. You're going to call in uh, once a week to pretrial service. Start that to amazing. The pretrial people. You're going to do this. All these things, I was like, Man, they're getting, this person's getting a tough probation. And then I listened to it, and they they haven't been convicted of anything. These are their conditions while they are presumed innocent. And see what that shows? You see what that shows? It shows in Harris County you're not really presumed innocent. When you walk into Harris County, you're presumed guilty. And if anybody thinks otherwise, well, you're living in some kind of dreamland. If you're in the county courts, look like I kind of went nutty there. If Slightly. you're in the county courts, you're presumed guilty. And that's why they treat you that way. And that's why when you go in, a lot of times the bailiffs talk to you like you're, you've just been found guilty of a crime. Um, sorry. I think I the hunching over the table there. is what, what really got it. Uh, I had a gun. Um, I, I would say let's go back to the special prosecutor conversation, but, I mean, now that we've got him really riled up. No, I'm just pissed <laughs> me off. Just got pissed off. I had a guy uh, comes to me. I'm, 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 I'm not only not guilty, I'm, ac I'm actually innocent. DWI. It's okay. Let's go. He goes to, it's a, it's a refusal, they take the blood, it takes four to five months, six months come along, he's had the breath machine, he's had to report blood alcohol level zero, toxicology level zero. The man just spent six months of his life coming back to court every two or three weeks, yeah. a machine, a reporting. Wearing being, him down, they try to wear people wearing down. Wearing him to get, down. So even if you get bond, the judges try to wear you down by making you come every three weeks, whether you need to or not, because nothing happens every three weeks. And it's like for somebody that's holding a job, and then every time they got to explain to their boss, I got to go back to court. Why are you going back to court? For nothing. For nothing. For absolutely nothing. Nothing. So that my lawyer can try to get another reset until this case can be resolved. I had another issue to, recently in Fort Bend. What they do is they make you, you don't even get a court, you're, you're assigned to go to the Fort Bend courthouse at 8 a.m. You don't even get a courtroom until you're indicted. Right. You just go, you literally go to a table behind the escalator to check in once a month and for four to five months until you get indicted. I mean, and people are taking off work. People are having, and you're getting bond conditions. In it another works. county, uh, Jackson County, that's what, probably 70 miles down the road. You don't go unless and until you're indicted. You what? don't have to show up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that my is that my level? So the bottom line is everybody does it differently. The idea is, of course, we all understand that people are presumed innocent. If you, well, the if law you, says that, but in reality, it, I don't really believe people believe in it. Well, but I don't think. But here's the thing: I also think, that, unfortunately, the majority of jurors who walk in there don't believe it either. Well, yeah, that's the, I mean, one of the they, first they questions the I ask them, Jimmy, when they come in there is, raise your hand if you. First thing you thought is, I wonder what he did. Yeah, right. to be sitting here. Well, and then I say, not me, because they usually <laughs> wonder what I did. Uh, well, if you look at the but they, they every time they raise their hand. It, so I ask them to rephrase it. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you should think about thinking about, I wonder what they're accused of. Yeah. People don't walk in thinking that. They think, I wonder what they did. Hmm, let's see what we can do now. Mm -hmm. I think our courthouse for so long has been so, for lack of a better word, redneck, backwards thinking that there is this incredible presumption of guilt in that courthouse. It starts from the moment people walk in, they're treated in an abusive manner, and when they get into the courtroom, they're treated in an abusive manner. When they get before the judge, many of these judges treat them in an abusive manner, not all of them, but it's it's... You sure, I'm sure a lot of, think of the innocent person that's sitting there and how they're treated in such an abusive manner, they don't feel like they're presumed innocent because I don't think most of the judges actually do. And maybe the judges just get kind of 
tired because after a while, a lot of people do plead guilty. So maybe in the judge's mind, they just figure, well, probably most of them are guilty. Yeah. And that's not true because uh, a lot of cases get dismissed that you folks out there in TV land never hear about. You don't hear about the dismissals that we get got all three the time. today. Yeah, there you go, three today. Okay. Well, I got 70 today, so. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> He just beat. Not, yeah. not I actually oh, did have three. Oh, they, oh, they, oh, they were all in traffic court. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Uh, yeah. we, got another, we got another phone call. I want to get in here. Uh, kind of big with that number. Hello. Thanks yeah. for calling Reasonable Doubt. Real big. How you guys doing tonight? Great. How are you? Good. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Absolutely. I was just calling because I know uh, Mr. Fickman's from uh, Midland County. Uh oh. And uh, I heard you guys on there talking about how tough it is there. Uh, we had a case up here where uh, we had the case. It took three days. A jury came out, said not guilty. And within two minutes of the case, uh, it was Mark Bennett. He said, I'm going to file that expunction, you know, for the right of expunction. And the DA turns around and looks at him and says, I'm going to object to the expunction. Oh. And we just had a case that took three or four days. You're talking about backwoods hit come to Midland County. Yeah, I was raised there, so I'm... Um, Thanks for the call. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that DA is just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, DA was wrong. Yeah, well, I'm sure Mark educated him on the law. Quickly. Yeah. I yeah. bet that pleading was filed the same day. Yeah, I don't... Mark. Mark would not back down. No, no, probably not. But, uh, yeah, I mean, going back to it, I mean, the, the presumption of innocence, unfortunately, I think we all see it every day. It's, it's, it's just lip service. I think I th that, uh, you know what it connects to? It connects to where this conversation started tonight about the lawsuit. The lawsuit and the abuse of the poor in the misdemeanor courts is really an outgrowth of people being treated like they're presumed guilty. If the judges really thought these people were innocent, I think they would treat them in a different fashion. And they wouldn't so easily accept a guilty plea from somebody who was just 20 minutes before appointed a lawyer who the judge knows very well that lawyer hasn't investigated the facts, hasn't investigated the law. All they've done is gone back and conveyed the offer and now they're coming out and pleading guilty and the judge very happy to take your plea of guilty. Thank you very much. Next, next, next. Well, and, and, I, and I mean the judges know yeah, that they have, this, this person agree. has not had any legal representation. And, and I don't want to, uh, you know, Sorry. keep piling on the mainstream media as so many people do, but I, I do feel like that they are somewhat complicit in this because when they cover murder investigations, oh, yeah. the, way, the way they cover it, the angle of the story that they do puts the presumption of innocence and, and, and switches it around where they report in such a fashion that I believe, I mean, look, everybody and, and sounds look, guilty. Well, and look, just right. as much as you hate Trump, the fact is the media's coverage of it. I don't hate Trump. I just want him to move and never. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the media's coverage of pretty it sure I hate has, has, has pretty much assured that nobody involved in this administration is going to get a fair trial. I mean, come on. The bottom line is Mike Flynn can't get a fair trial. He's already been convicted. He has. I'll give him a fair trial. You can point me at the judge. <laughs> special I'll special judge, him, huh? I'll no. give him the fairest <laughs> trial. Look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a fan of Trump. I'm not a fan of the way he's doing things, but I'm just looking at it purely as a defense lawyer and saying, you know what? I mean, if I, got, if I was Mike Flynn's lawyer, we, there is no way we can get a fair trial in, in any jurisdiction in this country. Well, it wouldn't matter where you went, but you know what I said earlier is I hope that the uh, man that they appointed as special counsel, he has a great sterling reputation. I hope he gets to the truth, whatever the truth is. Right. So we have to, we, we're, we're in a way, our Constitution is kicking in, and I think that's a really good thing. Uh, we, we're not being ruled. Trump is not the ruler. He was elected president. Um, people need to remind him of that or try to. But I, I think Good what, luck what we're showing here is that, you know, we're going to have an honest investigation. I think the person they appointed will do Agreed. an honest investigation. And I think as Americans, we should all hope for that. If Mr. Flynn is not guilty and he didn't commit any crimes, then he should be cleared. Same thing for Trump. As much as I dislike him, as much as I think he's guilty, if he's not guilty, he should be cleared by the investigation. Let, let's say it this way, Jimmy, to, to kind of highlight your ideas. If the presumption is of guilt in our society as it floats around the air, we know, especially us sitting at the table and most criminal practitioners that care enough in this state, in this county, in our nation, we, ha we see not guilties every day in courtrooms across the country, right? Correct. And perhaps we have 15 minutes to talk to a jury, maybe an hour to talk to a jury. To me, it's always been the more 
higher the charge, the more a jury considers the presumption of innocence and things like this. I do believe that even if they walk in with that presumption of guilt, which especially with the example I just raised, I believe a good lawyer with good tools can set the tone to show this jury that, yes, they need to strict, strictly abide by that presumption of innocence. I agree. And you know, that's and, the and, lawyer's job is basically yeah. to get the jury to follow the law and presume their client is right. innocent. And as we know that there's not guilties around our nation, yeah. that's happening. Right. But, but that means that we're not going in on the same side as our potential juror panel. We're having to educate no. and teach in short time frames. Yeah, and you know, I read something the other day, and we only got about a minute left before Already. we have to get out of here. Oh. I mean, it's flown by like that. It's but I, I read an interesting perspective on it, and it said, you know, remember what you're trying to do, and you have to get your client to understand this. We're, we're never going to be able to prove your innocence. We're not here to prove innocence. We're, the state is here to prove you, try and prove you guilty. And, you know, you have to get them out of the mindset that we're ever going to be able, your, your client's not going to walk out. The best they're going to get is not guilty. They're never going to walk out with a piece of paper that says you're innocent. This is not going to happen. And uh, it's not on the list. Yeah. It's not on the list. Uh, we've got to wrap things up, guys, but I appreciate you coming on this program tonight. It was, yeah, uh, thank it was you an honor that. to have I'm both you I'm sorry that I there. almost crawled into the no. camera. Uh, no. It's all right. We, we need to Apologize. have some, We like to have animated people on this program. But uh, appreciate Rob Fickman, Top DuPont, stopping by tonight. Uh, we'll be back next week, ladies and gentlemen, another new episode of uh, Reasonable Doubt for your viewing pleasure. Come and join us next week. Check us out on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and send us some messages there. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next week.